muted. We're good to go. All right. Well, welcome everyone. Thanks for joining us for this webinar here this morning on dynamic seating. As uh, Beckett mentioned, my name is Michelle. I'm an occupational therapist in the Denver, Colorado area, and I am in private practice. Uh, my company is Access to Independence. Uh, this is sponsored today by Seating Dynamics, who manufactures uh, some of the dynamic seating components that are on the market and available to us. And here are our learning objectives for the day. Uh, this is a CEU approved course, and so we have these learning objectives. I want to remind you too as we move through this webinar here today, if you have any questions at all, uh, we will allow time for those towards the end, but I'm very open to questions all the way through. So feel free to type a question or comment in the chat box at any time, and I will pick those up as we go along. So in this webinar today, we'll be discussing a definition of dynamic seating. This is defined differently by different groups, and it's important that we're on the same page in terms of just what area of technology, what aspects we're discussing. And then we're going to talk about some options and clinical indicators for providing movement at the pelvis, at the knees, and at the neck. So just how are we going to define dynamic seating? Well, dynamic seating is movement which occurs within the seat and or the wheelchair frame in response to force from the client. So basically the client moves and as a result part of the seat or the wheelchair frame moves as well. The dynamic components absorb the force of the client's movement and that force is stored somehow in the dynamic components such as in a polymer or a spring and that assists the client back to their starting position. So important again that we're on the same page in terms of a definition. Uh, sometimes you might hear the term dynamic seating referring to other aspects such as a cushion that perhaps moves in response to the client. Let's say a Rojo cushion. As a client might shift their weight, the cushion responds and so some people may call that a dynamic seat, but in this situation we're talking about dynamic seating where there's actual movement occurring within the seating system or the frame. Dynamic seating has several clinical applications. The primary goals of dynamic seating include allowing movement for the client, diffusing force, particularly in those clients that have significant extensor tone. Those extensor patterns generate a great deal of force, so that force is absorbed and diffused. And then finally, to protect the seating system, the mounting hardware, and the mobility base. And last but not least, protecting the client themselves. I've been thinking about this a lot more recently um, and partially due to some of the experiences that the clients that I work with have had where not only is the uh, wheelchair frame at risk from large uh, strong movements, repeated forces, but the client themselves can be injured. Think about it this way, if the client is exerting enough force that they've just snapped their headrest clear off that chair, chances are they are exerting uh, a great deal of force through say the cervical area or other parts of their body. The client pictured here, although you can only see his legs, actually ruptured both of his patellas due to massive force being exerted through his lower extremities. He uses dynamic seating and that has uh, prevented uh, further injury. So let's look at each of these goals in more detail. Our first goal, allowing movement. So why do we allow movement in a wheelchair? For a variety of reasons. For a lot of our clients, by allowing the client some movement within their wheelchair, that can allow them to sit with better compliance and sit for a longer period of time within their wheelchair. They'll tolerate it better. It provides vestibular input. You know, uh, we 
are sensory seeking a lot of our day and this provides some of that input for our clients. It can increase alertness for really any of us, but research has shown that movement does increase alertness and decrease agitation, particularly in people with dementia, also in people who have sustained brain injuries. I think for a lot of this, a lot of us though we seek this out. If I'm feeling really tired, I might get up and walk around a little bit, try to wake myself up. Maybe if I'm really upset about something, I might pace the floor until I've calmed down. Providing movement for some clients can help them to be more functional in their tasks too. It depends on the individual clients, their level of function, and the tasks they need to complete. By providing some movement, we are providing some active range of motion and that can be helpful for the client in terms of uh, perhaps limiting loss of range, but just allowing those joints to move. And for some clients too, by providing movement within a limited range, we can actually see an increase in strength and postural control, particularly in the trunk and head. Our second main goal is to diffuse force. Some of our clients extend with a great deal of force. By providing a static system, when that client extends and hits that non-yielding surface, say a pair of foot plates for example, we can often observe that that extensor force seems to increase that the client seemingly has the only goal of getting out of that seating system, where if the component moves, it can absorb and diffuse that force, and that can reduce the extension pattern. pattern. It also reduces the amount of energy that this client is exerting. You know, I work with a lot of clients who have high tone, and a lot of my clients are quite slim and basically are performing aerobics all day long. It's really hard to keep enough calories in some of my clients and by diffusing this force the client's not working as hard and isn't exerting that level of energy. By reducing that active extension, reducing the energy exertion, we might find that the client will better tolerate their seating system, is less agitated, is perhaps now more functional instead of showing mostly these large extensor patterns and might again show an increase in strength and postural control because all of their movements um, aren't going into either massive extensor patterns or that collapse that tends to happen when the client is not extending. Gives them a chance to find that medium between my muscles are relaxed and my muscles are full on extended. And the third goal, to protect. We want to protect the seating system itself, that mounting hardware that attaches the seating system to the wheelchair base, the uh, secondary components such as the head support. Um, that mounting hardware can be particularly vulnerable to damage when there's a lot of uh, increased force against those components or repeated force against those, um, including the mobility base frame. And as I mentioned before, protecting the client. If the client is exerting enough force to break things off their chair, then injury is very possible. And we've uh, just started exploring the fact that perhaps clients that are repeatedly pushing or banging their head against the head support, again with enough force to break the hardware, um, could very well be experiencing some level of concussion and that's very, very concerning. Now some of our clients may require static seating. I recommend a lot of static seating but uh, it, you know, of course, depends on the um, participant uh, that you are working with, um, what their diagnosis is, what their particular challenges are. But I find that most of my clients can benefit from some degree of movement within their chair. Some clients will not tolerate that movement. It might trigger some undesirable results either in posture 
uh, startle, reflexive activities, lack of function. Uh, it might be that the client cannot be functional, such as using their technology unless they're static. Um, we might find that a client with too much movement could injure themselves if that, say, foot, for example, on a dynamic component can now move forward and collide with something. Now, dynamic product options tend to meet one or two uh, primary goals. The first is to prevent breakage of the wheelchair frame and seating system. So some of these dynamic options do not move very much because their primary goal is to absorb force and protect breakage. It's not to provide movement. So these are components, again, that do provide a dynamic response to force, but you may not see it or not see very much movement because the main goal is to prevent equipment breakage. The second category, however, is designed to provide a great deal of movement to protect the uh, frame or other components, but to really diffuse that force, reduce tone. Providing active movement for that seating tolerance, vestibular input, alertness, decreased agitation, etc. And hopefully you can see this animation here. This is a fully integrated system. It's not available in the United States, unfortunately. It provides movement in a num uh, number of locations. You can see them highlighted here in response to movement from the client. So there are many dynamic seating products that are available to us. We're going to focus on the ones that are available here in the United States. Of course, this can always change. One thing that does occur in our industry is companies tend to purchase one another, and sometimes that makes a product available to us that hasn't been before. It's very important that the assessment is completed by a team who really knows seating and mobility and who can trial this equipment out with a client. When I'm recommending dynamic equipment, I really try, uh, in the vast majority of cases, I am going to find a way to let this client trial the equipment first to make sure that the goals that we're trying to accomplish really are going to be met and that we don't have any uh, negative consequences of providing that movement. So let's talk about allowing movement at the pelvis. There's advantages and disadvantages to doing so. So let's review those. If the client can't move at their pelvis, if we've locked in that seat to back angle, we've used the type of seating strategies, secondary components, to keep that pelvis in a neutral position and not allow any degree of movement, then when the client attempts to move or exerts force through their body, it's going to be transferred to other areas of the body, such as the legs, such as the trunk, the neck. By allowing the movement at the pelvis in a controlled way, without loss of position, we can reduce some of that posturing. This can be tricky though. We know for a lot of our clients, particularly clients with increased tone, that by allowing movement at the pelvis, bad things can happen. So the trick is how do we provide movement in a controlled manner that allows the client to return to a neutral starting position, a neutral pelvic position without rotation, obliquity, or tilt if the client can achieve that starting position. Providing movement of the pelvis also allows the client to shift weight. So even in clients who cannot otherwise perform an independent weight shift, by providing some movement at the seat to back angle, it does provide some pressure relief and hopefully will lead to uh, increased comfort for the client. Now, when a client moves at the pelvis, when we allow the seat to back angle to open, this can result in a posterior pelvic tilt when the client comes back to a neutral starting position. And so a lot of the design 
of these systems, particularly a dynamic back, is designed to ensure that the pelvis comes back to a neutral position. This is a picture of Spencer and he's using a kid rock. The kid rock is also an integrated dynamic seating system where there's movement that occurs at the knees and the hips at the same time. Uh, he, this is no longer made in the United States. So on the left side you can see he's extending with a great deal of force. We can only imagine what's happening with his pelvis. It's um, lifted up. He is quite extended at the hips, but on the right you can see that he has landed back down and his pelvis amazingly comes back to a nice starting position. So even if the client, when they move, perhaps moves into a suboptimal position of that pelvis, as long as that pelvis returns to neutral, uh, when the client goes back to upright, then that's okay. For some clients, if we allow that pelvis to move, it might mean that the pelvis moves into a more destructive posture where we're not at that neutral starting spot. Sometimes allowing movement of the pelvis into that posterior pelvic tilt, that more extended hip position can lead to generalized increased extension and spasms, and the client may not be able to return to that neutral starting position. So important to keep that in mind. This is one of the reasons we have to watch and see what happens when the client actually moves. So as I mentioned right now, there are no integrated dynamic seating systems available in the United States, meaning a system that moves in more than one area in response to client movement. But there are a number of options in terms of dynamic backs. So movement occurs only at the back, but we can combine this with other dynamic options, such as a dynamic head support, or dynamic leg rest to allow movements in other areas of the body. Now I'm going to be showing several videos here depending on my internet connection today as well as yours. I'm hoping you'll be able to see these if you cannot uh, bear with me. This is the Miller's Dynamic Backrest Interface and it extends at the level of a biangular back. A biangular back is a two-piece back. The lower piece goes to about the top of the pelvis, about the PSIS, and then the upper portion extends slightly beyond that. This is a commonly used linear back. In this case, Miller's has adapted this to provide movement at this junction through hydraulics. By providing the movement at the level of the biangular back, the pelvis is more likely to assume a neutral position when or remain in a neutral position during movement. Seating Dynamics also has a dynamic back and hopefully you can see the animation here on the left side. This has an adjustable level of resistance. So it comes with four different polymers and depending on the polymer that you choose, more or less resistance is provided. So the client extends and the energy built up in this polymer allows the client to return to upright. This locks out to prevent any movement if that is required. It's important to have a variety of resistances available if possible because some of our clients who have very, very strong extensor tone may require uh, quite firm resistance, whereas clients who maybe don't have a lot of tone but seek out a lot of movement, that vestibular input, might need a much softer polymer. And here's a video of that dynamic rocker back in action. If you are able to see this video, you'll see on the left side, oh, and we've got a little audio on this one. <laughs> I'm going to turn that down. So if you look on the left side, you'll see this polymer, and you can see it being compressed 
by the client and then it helps the client get back to upright. On the right, this is Daniel and he's watching his favorite baseball team, the Denver Rockies or Colorado Rockies, and he has um, extended his legs quite a bit and there's some extension going on in the back as well. And as he relaxes, his legs will slowly come down and his back will come forward as well. Sunrise Medical also has a dynamic back and it's pictured here. You can see these blue polymers and it will work with their mono back or with dual back canes and it's available on their quickie manual wheelchairs. It does have a lockout feature as well. It allows the client to extend and then again assist the client back to upright. In my personal experience with this, and it's a rather new product, so I do not have a lot of experience with this yet, but um, the pivot point is rather low. And I have a client actually who's using this right now who is moving his dynamic footrest very readily, who's moving his dynamic headrest very readily, but the back is just not moving at all, despite the movement in these other areas. And uh, we believe it's because of the pivot point and we're changing to a different dynamic back as a result. This is the dynamic backrest mounting hardware from Stealth Products. And it is, if you could see my arrow, right in this section where the knob is. So it looks very similar to typical hardware that's often used to mount a linear back to a seating system. But this mechanism allows a slight degree of movement. This is an example of a dynamic back which is not designed to provide a large amount of movement. It's designed to protect hardware. So the movement is quite slight just enough to help protect from damage. So if you're working with a client who tends to damage their equipment and you want to prevent that, but perhaps the client will not tolerate a large amount of movement. Perhaps the client responds in a negative way or uh, their posture does not respond well to that movement. You could use something like this that provides a small amount of movement. So that's a little bit about providing dynamic seating at the pelvis. I want to stop for just a second and make sure we don't have any questions or comments at this point. So again, feel free to type those in. If I don't answer right away, I will as we move forward. All right. So as people are typing in any questions or comments, I'm going to go ahead and move towards uh, dynamic seating for the lower extremities. When we're providing dynamic seating at the lower extremities, we're capturing movement primarily at the knees and sometimes also at the ankles. This can be a rather complex movement because when somebody rocks back with their pelvis, pretty much that seat to back angle is opening up. The pivot point of the seat to back angle is very critical. If it's too low, the client may lose their position. Um, Miller's back at, with the biangular back is attempting to do that higher. The seating dynamics back also has a higher pivot point. But capturing movement at the knee is tricky because when a client extends, this movement is an arcing movement and some of the force goes downward as well. And this is a rather complex uh, combination of movement to capture. Oh, we have a question here. Let me answer here real quick. Julia has asked, do you always lock out the dynamic back when the client's riding on the bus or in a van? That's a great question. I think a lot of transportation companies, whether it's a school bus or public transportation, if they're aware that the client has a moving part on their chair, would feel better with that locked out. And I think most manufacturers do encourage uh, that to um, 
be locked out during transportation. But the rest of the time, I usually leave that open. And uh, Carrie has asked, will you talk about Autobach or R28 snug seat dynamic options? Uh, those, I, we are going to talk about an Autobach um, dynamic headrest, but in terms of snug seat, those are not items that you can place onto a wheelchair. Uh, they come as a part of a very specific seating system on a stroller base. So yes, those are options that are out there as well. Um, and sorry, we don't have time to go into uh, those in more detail here today. All right, so what are some of the advantages of providing movement at the lower extremities? Well, there's a lot of clients we work with who will not tolerate having their feet restrained in any way, shape, or form, but perhaps would tolerate it if the footrest assembly, the footrest hanger, moved in response to movement from the client. Because those clients, without having their foot perhaps within an ankle hugger or shoe holder, would tend to keep their legs outward where the feet might be injured and do not receive the stability and weight bearing that occurs when the feet stay in contact with the foot plate. So this might allow us to actually secure the foot as appropriate to the foot plate to protect injury, to provide weight bearing, to provide that stability, but allow the client to better tolerate this because they can move. Oops. There are disadvantages to providing dynamic seating at the lower extremities though. In order for the dynamic component to move, the foot generally does have to be attached, secured to the foot plate. Otherwise, the foot will simply move forward of the dynamic component. If we restrict the feet in any way, then that can keep the client from an independent transfer. Uh, the client may be unable to uh, remove their feet from that dynamic assembly. And some clients, no matter how much movement we provide, are still going to fight any restriction uh, of the movement of the foot. So let's look at some of our options for providing this dynamic movement at the legs. Miller's has a dynamic footrest gas spring pictured here on the right. It telescopes or extends downward about two inches. This does not move forward, it only moves directly down. Think about it for a minute. Many of you are sitting right now. If you were to extend at your legs, your movement tends to go forward and downward. Again, it's a rather complex movement to capture. This only captures that downward movement. For some clients, this will work just fine particularly clients who have very tight hamstrings and may not be able to open that angle, extend at the knee. That force may truly go downward. As this is a hydraulic component though, if the client's angle of movement does not closely match the angle of the hydraulic, this system may not always be activated by the client. The Miller's dynamic footrest coil pictured below allows for some rotation at the foot plate. So this is not designed to move downward, but to allow the foot to move outward. Now, not many of our clients are going to move outward with their feet with a great deal of force. This often is designed to prevent breakage of wheelchair components. If that footrest or foot plate contacts something like a doorway or the edge of a, a van door or lift with a great deal of force, the spring will absorb that energy rather than the footrest hanger breaking. So this is another example of something that's designed primarily to prevent that breakage of components. This is another option from Miller's. It's their dynamic articulating footrest hanger. And you can see, hopefully, in this video that this person is able to push downward and out. So this is designed through hydraulics to capture that extension downward and that arc upward. 
This can be retrofitted to a lot of different chairs. I've played with this a lot over the years and have had um, a little inconsistent results with it. And I think it's because, again, our clients tend to have very complex movement at the legs. And if the client's pattern of movement doesn't closely match that of the hydraulics, or if the pivot point of the dynamic component isn't in the right relation to the knee, uh, sometimes my clients can't move the mechanism. It will jam. Seating Dynamics also has a dynamic footrest. This telescopes one and a half inches, so extends downward. Like with the uh, Miller's similar uh, telescoping option, uh, this can work well for clients who have tight hamstrings and really can't move their knee into extension, but can move downward. And then you can use this in combination with knee extension up to 30 degrees. It also offers dynamic dorsi plantar flexion, 17 degrees in each direction. Uh, probably most of our clients are going to push, extend into plantar flexion. And then the resistance is adjustable through springs. Since this does not use hydraulics, I have found that it captures my clients' movements a little more readily, and I like being able to change the resistance to match that individual client's needs. One thing to keep in mind with these resistances, because uh, I work with a lot of children in my practice, is uh, sometimes people will ask, well, how much does a client need to weigh for a certain level of resistance, whether that resistance is in a hydraulic, a spring, or a polymer? Well, it's not really so much weight. It's how much force that client can exert. I work with some very small clients who may not weigh much, but still exert a great deal of force through their components. So it's something that you have to look at with that individual and play around with to make sure that you've reached the right level of uh, resistance. Here on the left, someone is demonstrating the movement of the seating dynamics, dynamic footrest. You can see that it's extending, it's moving forward, and showing that plantar flexion. And then on the right, this is one of my clients. I have the volume up again. This is Spencer. And Spencer used to use Kid Rock. We saw a picture of him earlier, but the Kid Rock is going away. So he has now transitioned over to these. And as he is exerting force, as he's excited and extending, he's able to uh, readily move these. And that, again, is diffusing his force so that we're not seeing the resultant extension throughout his entire body. All right. So again, before I move forward, I want to stop and make sure we don't have any more questions at this point, particularly about uh, these lower extremities. You know, the uh, Kid Rock system, which again is off the market right now, did allow us to lock out the footrest. That's not the case with the um, uh, the current offerings from Miller's, from uh, Seating Dynamics, these do not lock out at the leg. All right, I'm not seeing any more questions right now. If you're typing, feel free to keep typing, and I'll pick those up as we keep moving along. The other main area that we can provide dynamic movement is at the neck. Many of our clients can extend with a great deal of force at their, uh, at their head support uh, behind the head, and that can lead to extreme forces occurring uh, in the cervical area, uh, even in the back, and can result in damage to equipment behind the client. So providing some movement at the neck can reduce breakage of the head support mounting hardware in particular. Um, it can reduce loss of alignment of the head support. You know, I can get in there with my Allen wrench and try to tighten things down as much as I can, but my clients often readjust their head support for me because they're exerting so much force against the components. 
and again, particularly in combination with other dynamic components, we can diffuse force. Now, I find that in my clients, if I can only provide a dynamic component at the head, it doesn't have as much of an impact for many of my clients as it does if I combine that with the dynamic back or dynamic footrest hangers. Um, I often combine this with something else. Not always. In the picture, actually, the young man uh, on this slide here, he did not have adequate range of motion at his knees or his hips for a dynamic component, but had a tremendous amount of extension. And so the only place we were able to really effectively provide movement was at his head, and it helped. I would have liked to have provided movement elsewhere, but we, again, were unable to. But there are some disadvantages to providing movement at the head. For many of our clients, moving the head beyond that perfectly upright position at the neck, any neck extension can lead to postural insecurity or trigger reflexive responses such as a moro or a tonic neck response. So this is again very important to consider when we're looking at different options to make sure that we are, um, it's clinically appropriate, clinically indicated to provide movement at the neck and how much movement. And there's a number of different options that are available to us for movement at the neck. This is from Miller's and it is their dynamic headrest horizontal adjustment bar. You can see that it moves directly rearward on a spring and the shroud has been moved out of the way slightly to uh, allow us to see that spring. Usually that is in place covering the spring because one of the challenges of providing movement at the neck is we're by the head and most of our clients have hair. Hair can get caught in these dynamic components and can get pulled clean out and that's not fun. So it's important that the dynamic component is protected so that or shrouded somehow so that the hair isn't caught in there. Also, obviously, it's going to be a pinch point for fingers, for siblings, let's say, or other people around the client. One challenge with this horizontal adjustment bar is it captures movement directly rearward. Some of our clients, when they extend, also tend to rotate, and this mechanism sometimes can jam. Autobach has this dynamic rock and lock headrest bracket and the dynamic portion of this is the silver area. It has a spring and this will move about one and a half inches and it is shrouded to protect both fingers and hair for the client. It does work primarily with Autobach head pads. Um, I'd have to double check my notes on this. I think it might be possible to use this with some other ones, but primarily designed for those Autobach uh, head pads. Seating Dynamics also has a dynamic headrest. The single axis is available now and it moves along that Y axis midline. So it captures that movement directly back and it moves about eight degrees. The amount of resistance can be changed. There's different elastomers that are, if you can see my cursor here, that are in this section here uh, where it is mounted. A multi-axis version of this is pending and it will move in various directions, capturing posterior movement and rotational movement. So far in testing this relatively new product out, I found that even if you push along one edge of this head pad, and this works with a number of different head pads from different companies, um, even if you push on one edge as if you were rotating, it still does move actually in response to client movement. This is the Stealth Tone Deflector. It fits uh, behind, well, between their mounting hardware and any of the stealth head supports, and they certainly do have a lot of them. It moves in about 10 degrees in any direction, and it has a, a 
I think three or four polymers inside of this deflector. Now like the back mounting hardware that we looked at, this does not move as much as a lot of the other headrest options, dynamic headrest options, and it's not designed to. This is primarily designed to protect the hardware for the client, not to provide a lot of movement. So I use this with clients who cannot tolerate movement, again perhaps due to postural insecurity or elicitation of reflexive responses, but who do break their headrest hardware. So it has worked well for that population and I have yet to have a client break one of these which is saying something because I've used this with a lot of clients who were chronic uh, headrest destroyers. This is a unique option from uh, Symmetric Designs. Let me find my, where's my cursor here? Hmm, I have lost my cursor. Hang on a second here. There it is. I'm going to get this video going for you. This is the Axion Rotary Interface. And again, hopefully you can see this video here. It allows the client to turn their head while they're in their seating system. Oop, let me turn down the volume on this one too. There we go. And you can see it really works best when the client is also using a head strap. On the right here it's pictured with their head support called the Savant. And it really doesn't have any friction. It's designed for someone who doesn't have a lot of tone, who more likely has some muscle weakness or even paralysis, uh, but can turn their head if their head is strapped in. If you move your head forward of this, it tends to kind of uh, slide to the side. All right. And again, if you have any questions, feel free to pop those in or any comments. I'd love to know, too, if uh, any of you have played around with some of these dynamic components, if you're using dynamic uh, seating right now. Oh, and then also, uh, it's always important to remember that these components can be used in combination. This is a brief video clip of the back, the headrest, and the footrest support all being used together to capture those large extensor patterns or clients who just really seek out that movement. All right, looks like we have a question here. Hi there, Joe. Joe has asked, do you use tone deflection dynamic hardware and other components in conjunction with various foam densities to achieve a result? Um, you know, that's an interesting question. Before a lot of these dynamic components were even available uh, in my practice setting, we were often playing around with various densities of foam. So for example, when we didn't have something that allowed the knee to extend, we would put some dense foam underneath the client's feet so that when they extended, when they pushed out their feet, the foam would hopefully absorb some of that force uh, because we were just flying by the seat of our pants. We didn't have a lot of product option at the time. So it is possible when we're using these dynamic components to combine that with the seating system in general to remember that as the client's moving within the seating system, the seating materials can absorb some of this force as well. So depending on the material, some materials absorb force as well, some recover well, some do not. So the foams that tend to recover very well are very springy HR foams. Uh, they work great for absorbing force and recovery, but they're not so great in terms of um, durability over time and the pressure relieving capabilities of the foam compared to say T-foams and Sunmate. Those foams can absorb force, but they stay rather depressed. They stay compressed. It's hard for them to recover. So great point. When we're looking at all this dynamic stuff, of course we have to look at that in context of what wheelchair frame are we recommending? Is this a durable enough frame for a client who's breaking things in addition to adding on dynamic components? Um, what type of seating are we looking at? All right, so I would like to uh, wrap this up 
for our last section of the webinar with two case studies that hopefully will illustrate some of the different applications for uh, this dynamic seeding. First we have, if I can get over there, Rachel, there we go. Rachel is 12 and she has cerebral palsy. She also has optic nerve atrophy and really um, almost no vision as a result and a lot of seizure activity. She has a lot of sensory issues and uh, seeks out a tremendous amount of sensory input. If she doesn't have that sensory input, she pretty much checks out. When I met Rachel, she was in a tilt and space manual wheelchair with a linear seating system. She was in this manual chair primarily at school, but her mom reported that at home she spent most of her time in a typical rocking chair. So I determined that Rachel didn't really require very much postural support. She not only could sit up independently in this rocking chair, but she rocked and rocked and rocked. She required that mobility base primarily to move her for that dependent mobility because she's non-ambulatory and uh, has never attempted any degree of uh, self-propulsion. She does not have enough motor control to self-propel a manual chair and her vision and uh, cognition are uh, quite impaired. When she's in that manual chair though, she checks out. You can see here, this is her typical position. She takes her arm, she tucks it underneath that anterior uh, trunk support. She props her chin on her fist and closes her eyes. And that's how she stays all day long at school. Now the main reason I became involved with Rachel is because her communication device uh, or her uh, speech language pathologist was trying very hard to find a way for Rachel to access her communication device. Well, she wasn't accessing it, I believe, primarily because she was so withdrawn throughout her day. The school assumed that she was just asleep and I'm sure she was napping some of the time, but there was just nothing to engage her. But in her rocking chair, her head snaps up and she is much more alert. She begins uh, making vocalizations. She seeks out uh, further sensory input. She's engaged with her environment. So my thought was, hmm, how can we provide some movement in her manual chair and see if we can get her to engage at school and with her communication device? So we tried the Kid Rock with her. She tried this out for about two weeks. We were able to get a demonstration one and I wanted to really make sure this was going to work for her. She was definitely more alert and engaged than when she was in her own manual wheelchair. It did take her a while to figure out that this moved. We had to move it for her. So I was pushing back on the back and encouraging her to move until she discovered that she could move it herself. We had to use the lowest tension springs that were available because she doesn't exert a lot of force, she just moves. And we wanted the chair to respond very easily to any attempt of movement to encourage her to move, which helped her to be more alert. Again, the Kid Rock is no longer an option. So that was Rachel. Let me go back to Rachel here for just a second. Um, some of the clients we work with seek out movement. I think all of us move. We seek out movement. Movement is very, very important to a number of aspects. Um, again, alertness and decreased agitation for all of us. For Rachel, it's particularly important. And I'm constantly amazed how many of the clients I work with have a large uh, degree of sensory issues as well. Uh, personally, I'm convinced that a lot of the clients I work with are unable to move through their environment due to significant physical limitations and so their lack of sensory input is really quite significant and providing that sensory uh, through movement of the chair can be very, very important. So. This is an example of a client who really needed to move. Some of these clients move with a lot more force but really need to rock and roll during their day. 
Now we've seen a few pictures of uh, Daniel throughout this presentation. I've been working with Daniel since he was a young boy. At the time uh, that he was nine years old, he was in a manual tilt and space chair and a linear seating system. You can see in this picture that he has um, quite a bit of supports. He has some rather unusual shoulder pads. We were trying to retract his um, shoulders a little bit because he was rounded so significantly. He has a subaceous bar on because his tone was just absolutely out of control and we are trying desperately to keep him within his seating system. Daniel, despite his small size at the time, is uh, very, very strong. He was routinely breaking things on his chair even at the tender age of nine years old. And since that time, as we were trying to address this as best we could within a seating system, he dislocated both of his elbows from extending his arms and crossing them in front of him with such force and he had uh, has injured both his knees from strong extension. He ruptured both his patella tendons, his knees were red and swollen a great deal of the time and we were really working hard to address this however we could within his seating system. I'm going to go back one slide here. Here you can see I'm holding his arm in an arm trough that we tried. This was before he dislocated his elbows. We were afraid that this would uh, be the result of his strong extension and we tried for a short period of time to strap his arms into these arm troughs. But he was fighting it so much that his doctor was afraid he would literally break his arms. We were concerned with that as well and so we stopped strapping his arms and as a result he dislocated uh, both of his elbows. He does have a baclofen pump. He's had a horrible time with this over the years. Um, there was uh, twice where upon increasing his dose he ended up hospitalized. Um, he just has not tolerated the medication well and it's a constant dance with his seizure medications because increasing baclofen increases the seizure threshold. As he got older we tried the Kid Rock for again about two weeks. He liked the system a lot. That's always a good sign when your client decides that they like something that you're trying and he could easily uh, move this. The spring tension in the back was not adequate um, he could extend his back and just hang out there for a very long period of time. It wasn't assisting him back to upright. So fortunately the company was able to obtain another set of springs that was off their order form that was uh, stronger than their strongest spring and that worked well for Daniel. So we did very well in a Kid Rock 2. Here he's extending quite a bit at the back. His legs aren't extending so much in this picture. He eventually moved into a molded seating system, uh, Aspen seating orthosis, because he was beginning to develop a scoliosis and we wanted him to have enough support. Uh, this is typically a one-piece system. They adapted it at the time into a two-piece system to allow movement at his back. As he grew though, he was out of alignment with the pivot points of those dynamic components. It's very important to keep that in mind as the client's growing. Otherwise, they will not move appropriately in response to movement at those joints. So the system wasn't meeting his needs and we ordered the Kid Rock 3. If you're familiar with the Kid Rock, again, no longer available, but the Kid Rock 3 was very, very large, very wide in particular. And the family just couldn't manage it. So we decided to order him a new tilt and space chair and we tried the seating dynamic components on there and this has met his needs very well. And this is Daniel playing on his adapted baseball team which he loves very much and you can see those elbows um, very hyper extended and he is extended at his uh, hips and knees in this picture because he is very very excited indeed. So what's our take home message? Well dynamic seating can either allow movement of the client within that seating system or provide movement of the seating component and or the frame. That protects 
The seat and frame from damage by diffusing that force protects the client from those huge forces and hopefully reducing tone and posturing by diffusing that force. And dynamic scene can provide active movement and that's very important for all of us, very important for a lot of our clients. All right, I want to make sure we have plenty of time here for questions. As Beckett mentioned, we have some additional time at the end of this hour for questions as well. But I want to open it up at this point for uh, those questions and comments. Uh, Julie has asked, do you use any dynamic options for clients who pull into hip flexion, uh, pulling the trunk forward and down? How do you accommodate this yet keep the client upright? Hmm. So, uh, yeah, there can be clients who tend to pull their legs up into that hip flexion and their trunk might come forward and down. This is pretty much opposite of the pattern. Most of these dynamic components are designed to um, uh, accommodate. There are some dynamic anterior trunk supports, um, mostly the ones that are vest shaped right now that have some stretch to the material that allows a client to come forward and then hopefully encourages the client to come back again. In terms of at the legs though, uh, you can certainly prevent hip flexion by strapping the feet down, but in terms of a dynamic option allowing hip flexion, I'm not aware of something that would do that. Um, probably the closest you could come to is using something that was rather stretchy at the feet, but it wouldn't allow very much um, movement. Uh, most of the dynamic anterior trunk supports are really designed to allow someone to lean forward, say to reach something, and then assist them coming back to upright if the client can't quite manage that on their own. Um, so that's a, a tough situation there. Carrie says that she's using the Stealth Headrest Tone Deflector combined with the Stealth Dynamic Back for hardware protection. Um, Again, I mentioned those are both components by Stealth products that are not designed to move a lot, but that's intentional. Some clients do not tolerate that degree of movement, but this can be very effective in protecting the hardware. Carrie also says that she's using the R82 Snug Seat X Panda uh, with two kids to provide movement. Again, that's an adapted uh, seating system that can be placed on a high low base or stroller base and that's working well for those kids that's great and ordering an Autobach Kimba with the dynamic back soon also an adapted stroller um, the trial went well with that and that she's ordering a uh, seating dynamics rocker back soon for an iris great awesome I hope that works out well for you You know, um, one thing to keep in mind with dynamic seating too, as people feel free to keep uh, typing in those comments and questions, these components do add to the weight of the chair and so often are not used as much for someone who might be self-propelling. Some of these can be used on a power chair, depends on the power chair, so you'd have to contact the manufacturer to see if it works for your particular model and then um, dependent mobility bases like those tilt and space chairs this works very well on. Anne has asked uh, have you ever used a Roho in conjunction with your dynamic options to provide an interactive surface? Um, you know I have not, per well I have um, <laughs> but not for that goal I did have a client who did well with the Roho and a dynamic back um, but I think what you're getting at there, Anne, is that in combination with the Roho and providing some movement that you're providing a greater degree of um, variation in pressure, uh, so ver uh, pressure relief, which is a great point. And I haven't done that so much, but I know some colleagues who have, and we're going to be discussing that. Actually, I should have said this earlier because I know some people have already jumped off of this, but at the International Seating Symposium this year, uh, there's a group of five of us who will be doing a pre-conference session on dynamic seating. We all work with different populations and one of uh, my co-presenters is going to be discussing use of dynamic seating um, 
with spinal cord uh, clients who have had a spinal cord injury, so different population, and I do think that you can use this in combination to have a greater impact on pressure distribution.